Okay, Coke, here we are again, carrying on with the uh, top end rebuild on this, uh, I say 1972 Triumph Trident T150. I say 1972 because I think the engine is much later, probably even 75. But it's got no engine number on it, so uh, or engine date stamp on it, so not quite sure. Right, a um, couple of things then to follow up. So we removed the barrels last time. And uh, I think I grandly said, of course, there's no clever way of really removing these barrels. Um, but, of course, there is. There's a couple of, uh, 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 of things you can do. I'm just trying to, I'm just grabbing a spanner while I want to do this. Yeah, that is Okay, so I did consider these, but then discounted them. Now, Mike Close, my dear old friend Mike Close, uh, has uh, reminded me that um, what you can do is, this 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 uh, nut has stayed in. It's actually the studs come out rather than the nut coming off. So I'll use this to demonstrate. So what you can do is you can put the tricore spanner. Oh god, I'm going to sneeze now. Oh blimey! <coughs> oh god, here comes another. <coughs> ah, hey, just when you're trying to do a video. Mm. All right. So you can put the tricore spanner on the nut and undo it. And what you do is put some sort of packing above the nut. In this case, I'm going to use a spanner, a small spanner, All right? And then what happens is when you undo that nut, it pushes the spanner against the bottom fin, and that can loosen the uh, break the seal off the uh, when you're trying to get the barrels off the cylinder head. Ah, uh, oh, blimey! Engage brain, get the barrels off the crankcases now. I didn't do it in this case. I have used it before and it works brilliantly, but I've done it on my Commando, which has got cast iron barrels. Um, and I haven't done it on this because, of course, it's got it's got alloy fins. And there's always a danger that if you undo that too much and push again, and, and, and this doesn't want to come off, then you're going to, again, break a fin. But I think that's unlikely, to be honest. And in my case, I think what I should have done was when I, when I managed to... Uh, raise uh, the, what, the the side of the barrels I could get to and hit. I should have used that method on the other side, this side, the timing side, where you can't get to the edge because of the, t the timing cover. And I should have used that side to, to uh, that this method to free this side. So I wasn't you know freeing the whole thing, but when I got one side free with a wood block knocking on knock on, on the edge of this flange, on the other side, put and you need to put a packet under there because this nut will come off before it hits the fin. So you want packing so the nut goes up and just, you know, pushes up. But obviously you need to be uh, doubly careful that you have undone all these, all the nuts. I can't tell you, it sounds really straightforward, but how many cases over the years have been ruined by people trying to get them off and simply because they haven't undone all the nuts. I mean, the classic one will come, oh, so we come to this. The classic one is the um, primary chain case on the T150 because everyone undoes all the nuts all the way around not realizing that there's these two in the middle which might look pretty obvious now but sometimes they're completely missed and so people undo and then they can't get the cover off and of course it's a difficult one anyway because you can't get anything behind it and then people start using all sorts not realizing that they've not uh, done those and done those right the second thing I should have done was um, if you've got non-hardening gasket compound, if you get a blowtorch and heat it up, it re-liquefies and frees up. So something like well seal. So this is, this is a method I use all the time for removing cases. You know, again, like the timing case is difficult because there's nothing to get behind to, you know, to knock against. So if you get a blowtorch and just heat it up all the way around, it re-liquefies the gasket cement, makes it... Uh, you know, releases everything and then the cover comes off now the only problem with that is that i've found over the years is this does not work it, this method does not work with um uh harding hardening gasket cement now uh, for those of you who are as old as i that would mean um oops put my hand over the lens that would mean red hermatite etc oh yes we might have mentioned the words red hermatite so i didn't do that this time because i thought to be honest i I didn't think that this was going to be um, a non-hardening uh, compound on this gasket. We're looking at it. I'm not so sure. And I think maybe it is non-hardening compound. Uh, 
in which case putting the blowtorch on it would have helped a lot to release the uh, you know just to make that initial break okay so there's two two uh, different ways uh, of releasing the barrels okay uh, and also in this case with heating up the um, the, the the joint that's on any any joint that's a really good method for free you know especially things you can't get to like the timing case or the primary you know it's very difficult to find anything you know to get to you've got the the sort of clutch spigot you know and, and maybe on some models you've got a, a spigot at the bottom but it's very difficult and so heat everything up with a blowtorch and and it will come off so when i was taking the barrels off those are two things i, I should have uh, mentioned so uh yeah uh did i say yeah so mike close uh, reminded me about the using the the the, the nuts to push the barrels off and uh, Jeff Mitchell reminded me about using the uh, blowtorch on, on things, which I, I did, as I say, I didn't use because I thought, ah, well, it's bound to be an old gasket. Uh, you know, it's put on years ago, it's bound to be hardening, but I'm not so sure it is. Right, anyway, enough of that. Right, what we're doing, so I, I, I've still not touched anything because what I'm, I'm still on like the strip down phase. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to remove the pistons. Uh, and uh, to do that, they've got the circlips on, and in my case, they're the sort of the standard circlips with the two little eyes on them. So we're going to use the circlip plier remove, uh, you know, circlip pliers to remove those. Uh, and uh, I'm 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 not sure I'm going to put those on camera, but to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to doubly 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 pack the uh, crankcase aperture with rags, etc., just in case one of these little beggars. Um, pings off as they as they can do these circlips, and the last thing you want is to going down into the crankcases. So because sometimes you never find them. If they ping off, they can go halfway across the garage, and then you think it you can't find it. So you think, did it go down the crankcases or what? Well, if you pack if you pack the whole thing, then you know it hasn't. Then I might then we'll just knock the gudgeon pins out, um, and the pistons will come off. We'll mark the pistons again, which which piston is which. So we'll go, if we do reuse them, I doubt it. But if we do, then they go back in the same place. And the only other thing is, if the gudgeon pin doesn't want to knock through when we've got the circlip out, then I use a, just a very gentle bit of heat, uh, just to I'll probably uh, just heat up the side of the piston and uh, uh, yeah, it's just the side of the piston, and then the, the gudgeon pin should just slide out. So we're going to remove the pistons. I, I, I'll see if I can put some of that on camera. And then uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove these two um, main bearing caps. One's marked D for drive side, and one's marked T for timing side. Okay, now th that's they they are the caps that hold the main bearings on the main bearing main bearing shells. They're plain shells. So I'm going to take those off. Uh, to inspect what the shells are like and that will maybe help us to decide whether or not we're going to then do a full engine rebuild uh, as people have been suggesting I mean that you know think it, the engine looks in pretty good nick you know the, the cams don't look at all worn camshaft just on first inspection everything seems pretty good so I don't know it's one of those it's, you know, it's a difficult one. People say, well, you got the barrels off, you might as well rebuild the whole engine. Well, it's a massive job rebuilding the whole engine. And to my mind, it's a bit like saying, well, you got the clutch off now, you might as well rebuild the whole engine. Or you got the timing case off now, you might as well rebuild the whole engine. Or you got the gearbox apart, you might as well, you know, I mean, just because I'm taking the barrels off doesn't mean, uh, you know, rebuild the whole engine. On the other hand, um, the engine is out of the bike. If you're going to rebuild it, you want to do it now, not after you put it all back in the bike, and then you've got to take it all out again if, you, if it does need rebuilding. So, it's one of those. So, but it's not to be under underestimated the job, you know, if we do decide to rebuild, it's, it, it's a big job. So, anyway, I'm going to take those caps off. We'll have a look at what the main bearing caps are like. Uh, and somebody mentioned, I forget who it was, uh, that, that, uh, that, that you might be able to actually replace the main bearing shells with the crankshaft in in um, situ i don't i've never tried it because obviously when you take the caps off the top half of the shell comes off the bottom half of the shell is under the crankshaft but they reckon that you could use something to push the shell around and so it sort of like came out 
at one end and then you can feed it back in so it goes back under the crankshaft but I've never tried that so we'll, we'll, we'll see we'll see okay so uh, enough waffle we'll get on and we'll take the pistons off and then we'll remove the bearing caps and uh, you know we'll take it a step at a time because the first thing before I start doing any work is because I know all the head needs to be doing you need to do the valves and the, and the rings and the cylinders I know that all needs doing obviously that's why we're taking the thing apart the question is does the rest of the engine need doing as well um, and hopefully by looking at the main bearing shells and so on we should have a, a better idea of of whether we need to do that or not. Okay, here we go with uh, piston removal. Timing side piston. So we've got two, two out at the moment. I'm just gonna try and protect the conrods. So I'm gonna protect them properly in a minute. I'm just waiting to get all the pistons off. rotate the engine to get this one as near top as pos check the gudgeon pins are protected so a bit more so a bit more on the aperture to make sure we don't lose that to circuit well, I'm going to move the camera back because it's a bit in my way now uh, and I'll try and hopefully it might stay in focus or, or come into focus for the first time. Okay, so we're going to remove the uh, circlip here. There we go, Ooh, and it comes. Then, because the other piston was a bit of a beggar, I'm going to also remove the circuit from this side. Normally you can get away with it and just... There we go, that's come out. Normally you can get away with it and just knock the gudgeon bin through without taking the circlip out on that side. But the last piston was such a pain and the uh, gudgeon bin didn't want to come out. So what I'm going to do now is just very lightly heat the piston around the gudgeon pin area. It's got a name for it, this bit of piston, but I can't remember what it is. It's the bit of the piston that, uh, that goes around the gudgeon pin as far as I'm concerned. Right, just heating it slightly to expand the piston because it's alloy rather than the gudgeon pin which is steel and just by giving it a little bit of gentle heat then hopefully the uh, gudgeon pin will not out. But then I've got a socket which is Big enough to fit on the gudgeon pin, but small enough to go inside the piston. And I've got uh, I've got a solid mark this time. Because I need to tap it, and I'm going to tap. There we go. Just tap it gently through. There we go. Until it's through enough too hot and off it comes and so that's all three pistons off now I'm going to mark this one just in case we get to use them again I don't think we will as I say but you know always good to mark them just in case we do so that's T for timing side and there we go we've got all three pistons off now and we're going to have a look what we've got examine the engine a bit more carefully and then we'll try taking off the uh, uh, the main bearing caps okay okay the uh, pistons are all off and what I've done is I protected the con rods so they don't hit the uh, don't get damaged on the sides of the crankcases which you want to do because any um, mark any chip or whatever uh, if they do catch then that can act as a stress point and that can actually lead to conrod failure just a little chip because all the stresses then go through that scratch that chip and okay so uh 
always need to protect the conrods. What I've done in this case, I've just put masking tape round so that uh, the whatever, you know, uh, I can still get to things. Normally you put toilet roll, hold, you know, some sort of card over it or something. But the trouble with that is it's a bit in the way and I want to see what's down in the crankcase. So first inspections, I've had a look at the um, uh, camshafts. They seem pretty uh, okay, Nick. Uh, and the Conrod seem okay. The only strange, I don't know how well that's showing up, but the um, it might just be the reflection on the flash, but there's obviously some damage to the end of the of uh, one of the crankshaft flanges on this drive side. Uh, it looks like it's been dropped or something at some point in the past. I don't think it's any damage, you know, from being in the engine. I, I can't believe that, but obviously at some point the crankshaft's been out and I think someone's dropped it or whacked it or done something stupid with it. So uh, that's that's one element of concern. Um, anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to knock the... You see there's lock tabs on these uh, main bearing uh, cap. These are the main bearing caps. And these are the studs and nuts that hold them down. And they've got lock tabs on. So I'm going to take off the lock tabs and knock the lock tabs off and then remove these main bearing caps so that we can see what the bearings, the actual main bearings are like inside, which might give us a bit more of an idea of whether or not we want to strip the entire engine. Hmm, signs of old, um, is that old red hermitite there? <laughs> I think it is, you know, yes. Uh, I think that's where the crankcases have been put together at some time in the past. And yes, we have our red hermitite, oh, joy. The very thought. <laughs> For those of you who have never had the joys of working with red hematite, then it brings back such um, fond memories, not. But that's what you used back in the day. And if you, were, if you were any good, you used half a gallon. And if you were no good, you used two gallons and squirted it everywhere. But there we go. Right. Uh, I'm going to so take those caps off. I'm not going to do that on camera. I don't know if I can get, uh, how I can get the camera to hold, to be honest. And uh, then we'll see what the bearing shells are like underneath right <clears throat> well i have to say i've come to a bit of an impasse i've got the pistons off protected the conrods and so then my great idea was that i was going to remove the main bearing caps so i could check the uh, condition of the main bearing shells underneath that run on the crankshaft Okay, so I can turn the engine around. I can't. There we go. Oops. However, um, I can't get the main bearing caps off in situ because, of course, they're kind of stuck on the two studs and, uh, you know, they don't want to come off. And due to the flywheel, I think I've mentioned the damage I've already seen on this, uh, on the corner of this crankshaft, didn't I? Um, but, um, Come on, where do I want to go there? Anyway, due to the um, position of the crankshaft, you can't get anything on to pull them up because there's always uh, one of the flanges of the crankshaft is always uh, in the way. You know, you can't get anything down. You know, the flanges of the crankshaft is always one on one side or the other, and often on both sides. So, you, you know, anyway, I can't get them out. So, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how to, to progress. So I'm going to have a chat with the owner and see what he wants to do, whether he wants to go for, a, just do the top end rebuild, carry on with that, we'll do the full um, <clears throat> rebuild. Um, yeah, yeah, the other thing was, I was also going to take off the, uh, I can still do that. Uh, I can take off the centre con rod and I can see what the big end's like because I can access that. However, you have to access that. <clears throat> to undo the con rod, you have to take off the uh, sub plate un underneath here. And of course, I've got this uh, engine on an engine stand, so I could get the sub plate off, but then I'd have to get, I'd have to take the engine back off uh, the engine stand, which is a two-man job. <clears throat> so I could then turn the engine on its side uh, to get to the... Uh, 
to the big end so I can undo the big end and take the corner out and have a look at the, <clears throat> the big end shells. So, not sure, blimey, it's, you know, it's lots of question marks at the moment. So, there's a lot of oil under here, though, you know, there's a lot of oil. Whether this is all coming from or all came from the push rod tubes or, or whether you know there's a leak under here as well, I'm not sure because it could have come down the push rod tubes and then blown back or. It could be leaks back here. That's the uh, that's the anti-drain valve, by the way. That little uh, sort of hexagonal thing covered in oil there. Press the wrong button. No surprise there. Right. Um, so I'm going to have a chat with the owner and um, uh, Richard Davies, um, who's another well-known triple owner. Um, He's uh, going to pop around at some point, and we're going to have a look together, and I'll, I'll get a second opinion, see what um, see what he thinks about about the old uh, thing. Um, I'm sort of fifty fifty on it, really. Um, you know, it all looks in it all looks in good condition, and you know, sometimes it's best to leave sleeping dogs lying. You know, you can, you, you know, you only have to make a slight mistake or something and, you know, it's easily done. You can actually create more problems by, you know, if it ain't, if it ain't uh, broke, don't fix it. On the other hand, you know, it's an old engine. We don't know the mileage on it. We don't know the provenance really of it, what's happened to it. And, you know, um, you know, we don't know what the clutch is like, primary chain. We don't know what the bearings are like because, of course, we haven't taken them apart. Not sure about the gearbox, etc., etc. So, and, and it, there is evidence of, of considerable oil leaks, as I say, particularly under this primary chain case. So, yeah, that that's uh, you know that's an area that would certainly benefit from being rebuilt, <clears throat> just to stop uh, massive oil leaks, which you don't really want. Anyway, sorry, there's not uh, a huge amount in this uh, in this video uh, of actual action because I'm still pondering whether or not to just do the top end rebuild or the whole engine. So next video, hopefully that will, uh, that uh, conundrum will be solved one way or the other. Okay, there we go.